It's January 9th here in Seoul and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with the stories making the headlines at this hour, starting with the termination of the 2018 inter-Korean military pact. The deal that secured buffer zones between the two Koreas has been practically nullified following Pyongyang's artillery firings over the weekend. South Korea military is going to resume artillery firings and drills near the sea and land border now. Hezbollah says one of its senior commanders has been killed in an Israeli airstrike in southern Lebanon. The Israeli military has now begun a new, less intensive phase in its war against Hamas, featuring fewer ground troops and airstrikes. Pittsburgh-based astrobotics mission to carry out the first U.S. landing on the moon since Apollo is being threatened, as the Peregrine lander suffered a critical loss of fuel just seven hours after launch on Monday morning. There will no longer be a buffer zone between the two Koreas. South Korea's military has made clear following the North's artillery firings over the weekend. Instead, SAR's artillery firings and drills near the sea and land border will resume. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Pei reports. On September 19, 2018, the two Koreas signed an inter-Korean military agreement that set up buffer zones for land, air and sea to reduce tensions and prevent accidental clashes. But following the North's recent provocations, the South Korean military officially declared on Monday that these zones outlined in the agreement are no longer effective. North Korea has breached the September 19 military agreement more than 3,000 times, and over the last three days, it has fired artillery shells in the West Sea. As a result, the zone where all hostile activities are banned no longer exists. The Joint Chiefs of Staff also said the military will not respond to every provocation initiated by North Korea, and instead conduct firing exercises according to its own schedule. The maritime buffer zone in the West Sea extends 135 kilometers. That's 85 kilometers south of the NLL, or the northern limit line that separates the two Koreas, and 50 kilometers north of the line. There is also a separate buffer zone in the East Sea that spans 80 kilometers. Provocative actions are prohibited in these zones, including firing artillery shells and coastal guns. The North had already said last November that it's withdrawing from the pact, and it has rebuilt guard posts inside the DMZ. With South Korea's announcement on Monday, the agreement is now practically scrapped. This comes after the South Korean military detected around 90 artillery shots by the North on Sunday afternoon. North Korea also fired over 200 shells on Friday and 60 on Saturday. However, in an attempt to shame the South Korean military's detection capabilities, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yo-jong, claimed the North had not fired a single shell on Saturday, but instead detonated explosives simulating the sound of artillery fire. The South Korean military immediately dismissed the statement, calling it a, quote, comedy-like propaganda. In fact, according to military sources, the South Korean military detected the North blowing up explosives only 10 times before and after Saturday's shelling, which shows the North's claims are not true. An expert says the intention behind North Korea's latest provocation is to grab local and international headlines. Signed in a world distracted by Gaza and Ukraine uh, that North Korea is saying we're still here and we're starting the year uh, uh, with these types of artillery rounds uh, that garners a lot of international attention. It... Pounds, Arirang News. South Korea's space race is about to pick up speed. Bills for its space agency were given a green light from a parliamentary committee on Monday, and they're set for a vote in the National Assembly today. Our Ishi who has this report. South Korea is one step closer to launching a new space agency. The National Assembly Science and ICT Committee on Monday passed bills to establish a new space agency that the Science Ministry has dubbed the Korea Aerospace Administration, or CASA. The bills passed are the special act for the establishment and operation of the agency and the revision to the existing Space Development Promotion Act. According to the bills, the new space agency will carry out policymaking, industry promotion, international cooperation, and more in the field of aerospace. It will start with fewer than 300 personnel, but will grow its size through active recruitment. 
The agency will fall under the Ministry of Science and ICT and will also be monitored by the National Space Committee. The existing Korea Aerospace Research Institute and Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute will now belong to the new agency, but the physical transfer of the institutions will require approval by the parliament. Both Kari and CASA will carry out research and development. The two main parties had conflicting views on this, with the ruling People Power Party insisting the space agency should carry out R&D projects that Kari is unable to, and the main opposition Democratic Party opposing this idea, saying it would create unnecessary overlap. The lawmakers eventually agreed to allow Kari to carry out its existing research and CASA to carry out other R&D projects. If the bills are approved at the plenary session on Tuesday, the space agency in Sacheon, Gyeongsangnam-do province, could start operations as early as May. Lee si Arirang News. The Lebanese military group Hezbollah says a senior commander has been killed in an Israeli strike in southern Lebanon. And despite Israel shifting to a lower intensity offensive in Gaza, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the war won't end anytime soon. Lee Sing Jia has more. Hezbollah says one of its top ranking commanders has been killed in an Israeli attack in southern Lebanon. Lebanon state media said Wissam Tawil, who is considered one of the most prominent figures in the Lebanese militant group, was killed in an Israeli airstrike that targeted a car that the commander was in. According to AFP, Tawil had a leading role in managing Hezbollah's operations in the south of Lebanon. However, Israel did not comment on the attack, but it did say it had hit Hezbollah targets in response to cross-border attacks. Regarding the war in Gaza Strip, the office of the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu released a joint statement from both the Prime Minister and Defense Chief Yoav Gallant, where the two stressed that the war there would not end anytime soon and that it would continue for many months. They also called for international support in order for them to continue the fighting in Gaza. Speaking to the New York Times, Israel Defense Forces spokesperson Daniel Hagari said its military has begun a new, less intensive phase in its war against Hamas in Gaza. He added that the new phase means fewer ground troops and airstrikes. The comments came hours before U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Israel to discuss the transition to the next phase in fighting and preventing the conflict from spreading. Meanwhile, Blinken sent a message warning to the Houthi militants in Yemen, saying they will face consequences for continued attacks on ships in the Red Sea. Blinken told reporters Monday in Saudi Arabia that some 40 countries have called on Houthis to stop their attacks. The top American diplomat also made stops in Turkey, Greece, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates in quick succession before his visit to Israel. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. Russia conducted a series of missile and drone attacks against provincial Ukrainian cities and villages on Monday, killing four people and injuring at least 38. The latest attacks targeted residential buildings and infrastructure. While Moscow says it had military industrial targets in Ukraine from the sea and air. Russia targeted four regions, including Kharkiv. The deadly attacks have continued since the new year, with Russian airstrikes over the weekend killing 11 Ukrainians, including five children. Fears are mounting that the Israel-Hamas war could spill over into a full-blown regional conflict. And Israel appears to have no interest whatsoever in de-escalating tensions in the Middle East. Let's turn to Professor Austin Nupe this morning. Thanks for coming on to our program. Thanks for having me back. It's great to be here. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has warned Hezbollah uh, that it should learn from what has happened to Hamas in the recent months of devastation over in Gaza. Professor Nupe, what might be the consequences of a full-on war with Hezbollah? Well, from the Israeli perspective, it's really a nightmare scenario to have three or four fronts having to combat an insurgency within the Gaza Strip, combating similar uh, insurgent efforts in the West Bank or the occupied territories, and then also on the northern front with, with Lebanon. It would be uh, akin to Israel's uh, invasion of Lebanon in 1982. Uh, but far bloodier than the, the war as, as recently as 2006 would really be difficult 
for the Israeli Defense Force. Definitely. And what Washington is so worried about is that the Israeli PM Netanyahu could wage the war on Hezbollah for a political gain. Is that so? What do you think? I think that's absolutely correct. You know, in uh, scholars of international security talk about gambling for resurrection, this idea that leaders that face difficult prospects at reelection or low support at home may expand war efforts to gain victory in order to increase their popular support. Uh, that's common both in the American and South Korean context, but also in Israel. So the, the worry is that the Netanyahu government's uh, rhetoric will escalate the war and that Secretary of State Blinken will be caught in the middle trying to tamp down tensions on both the part of Lebanon and Iran, the Gulf states and Israel. Very difficult task for an American Secretary of State. Right. We'll talk more about Blinken's visit uh, in the moment. But even if Israel focused on a full military campaign against Hezbollah, an American intelligence assessment believes that it will be difficult for Israeli forces to actually succeed in such a war. What are your thoughts on the assessment? You know, that's absolutely right. Uh, the, the fundamental problem, both with the Israeli offensive in Gaza and also its problems with Hezbollah, is that they're applying a military solution to fundamentally a political problem. There are four or five core political disputes, including uh, where you draw the line, sovereignty for the, the Palestinian Authority, the right of return, the deliberate targeting of civilians. All these are political issues that don't have a military solution. So even if the Israelis um, said that their primary military objective is to dismantle Hezbollah as an organization, it's difficult to see how you could do that tactically while also achieving your political objectives. Definitely. It's, a, it's an unsound definition, definition of victory. In relation to the previous question, what many officials also fear is that a full-scale conflict between Israel and Lebanon would be worse than the bloodshed that we saw back in 2006 between, uh, during the Israel-Lebanon war. What do you think? That's definitely the case. The, uh, since that time, Hezbollah has increased their capability, both their military capability and arms and tactics. It would involve uh, the deployment of the Israeli Defense Force in South Lebanon, they've mobilized something like 350,000 uh, uh, Israeli soldiers, reservists to fight. It would be a multi-front war. It would affect uh, not only Lebanese civilians, those in communities affected by the conflict, but also Israeli communities are, that are missing uh, not only family members, but uh, individuals that can contribute to the economy and, and uh, politics within the state. And so it's a no-win proposition for Israel and Lebanon, let alone uh, Lebanese civilians that live in the south of the country. Professor Nube, I'd like to wrap up with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's fourth visit to the Middle East. He has returned right. to the region. He's seeking to avert a wider Middle East war. Like I mentioned, this is already his fourth diplomatic mission to the area. Will his trip this time be any fruitful, though? So from a, a security perspective, we've already seen that Secretary of State Blinken's been able to uh, secure continued cooperation with the Qatari government uh, in operating U.S. Air Force Base in Qatar. So on the security side, that, that's been a, a fairly low-key success for the administration. Uh, what's incredibly difficult is the goal of trying to balance, uh, prevent an escalation in conflict. Oftentimes, these things are accidental, not intentional, and also making progress on one of the key objectives, which is a negotiated settlement between uh, Hamas and Israel in order to release the some 129 uh, hostages still in the Gaza Strip. That should be a, a core priority. And it's hard to see how the United States can make progress without the assistance of Qatar and perhaps Turkey on that front. Definitely. We should keep in mind that though there are still hostages held in the region. That's correct. Uh, Professor Nube, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it as always. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. In the U.S., the first controlled landing on the moon by a private space mission has hit a serious setback. Will it be possible to land on the lunar surface successfully? Our Choi soo with the latest. The world's first private moon landing craft, Peregrine Lunar Lander, is facing a serious technical problem. On Monday local time, Astrobotech, the U.S. firm that built the spacecraft, stated that it has a problem with the propulsion system causing a significant loss of fuel. They said the situation is serious enough for them to consider changing the mission goals. 
Peregrine was launched at 2.18 a.m. on Monday from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida on a Vulcan rocket. This 1.2-ton craft was scheduled to land on the moon on the 23rd of February. But about seven hours after the launch, an issue was discovered where the solar panels were not properly facing the sun, so couldn't properly charge the onboard battery. Astrobotic scientists managed to fix this issue, but also confirmed there was another problem, fuel loss. The Paragon Lunar Lander carries various cargo, including scientific instruments by the U.S. Space Agency, NASA, to study the lunar surface composition and radiation, as well as a small exploration robot the size of a shoebox developed by Carnegie Mellon University. NASA is just a customer in this project, though, and is not in charge. It paid 108 million U.S. dollars for Paragon to carry its equipment. If the spacecraft's landing is successful, it will be the world's first private lunar exploration to make a controlled landing in the moon and the first U.S. soft landing in the moon since Apollo 17 in 1972. Chesuhyang, Arirang News. This year's Golden Globe Awards turned out to be a proud moment, especially for the Asian community, with Stephen Yan taking home the Best Actor Award. That's a first for a Korean-American actor. Our culture correspondent Song Yoo Jin has more from Sunday ceremony. Hollywood's star-studded award season has kicked off, starting with the Golden Globes. The 81st edition of the annual awards, which celebrates the best in TV and film, was held Sunday local time at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Beverly Hills, California. Netflix's comedy drama Beef made history. Stephen Yun and Ali Wong became the first actors of Asian descent to win in their categories. Yun, a Korea-born American actor, clinched best performance by a male actor in a limited series, anthology series, or a motion picture made for television, while Wong won in the female category. Yun joked that there are some similarities between him and his character in Beef, while Wong spoke of her surprise. I'm a respectful but skillful and at times aggressive driver. I live in L.A., uh, so I drive the same not that different from Danny, that's not illegal. I mean, I think I was just really surprised. This is a really fancy event with a lot of fancy people. Beef continued its triumph, winning a third Globe with Best Television Limited Series. Adding to the Globe's history was Lily Gladstone becoming the first indigenous person to win Best Performance by a female actor in a motion picture drama. So every time I've felt a level of guilt or feeling like it wasn't really possible, my mom and my dad, my whole life, they've never once questioned that this is what I was meant to do. Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer was the top winner of the night. The three-hour biography of physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer picked up five awards, including Best Motion Picture Drama and Best Director. I think the, the, the tragedy and what drew me to the story is that certainly in the later part of his story, post-World War II, post-Trinity, he always maintained his loyalty to his country, what he needed to do, never apologized for what he did. Greta Gerwig's Barbie clinched the inaugural cinematic and box office achievement along with Best Original Song. This new award recognizes films based on box office sales and digital streaming viewership. With the Golden Globes now over, up next is the 75th Emmy Awards on January 15. Song Yujin, Arirang News. The prices of entertainment and cultural activities last year saw the largest jump in 27 years. According to Statistics Korea, the related price index increased 3.7 percent on year. Sports events, overseas group travel, photography services and singing rooms all saw large price rises. Fees for amusement facilities, performing arts events and cultural lessons also rose by over 5 percent. Meanwhile, portable multimedia devices, such as tablet PCs, saw an increase of 17.9 percent, largely due to higher launch prices for new products.
Good morning. I'm Kim Xiang, and now we turn over to stories from around the world. We begin in the U.S., where Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is under scrutiny for his failure to disclose his hospitalization to President Joe Biden and the Pentagon for several days. The Pentagon said that Austin resumed his full duties from his hospital bed on Friday evening after being in intensive care. Amid growing criticism of Austin for lack, for lack of transparency in notifying the chain of command, the White House said Monday that it will review the situation. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said Monday that there is no plan for anything other than for Secretary Austin to stay in the job. However, a number of Republicans, including former President Donald Trump, have called for Austin to be sacked. 70-year-old Austin was admitted to intensive care at Walter Reed Military Hospital on January 1st, but it was the fourth before, the made, before he made the White House aware of his condition. Austin is believed to be still in hospital. Pope Francis on Monday called for a universal ban on the practice of surrogate motherhood, condemning commercialization of pregnancy in his annual address to the Holy See's diplomatic corps. In his 45-minute address to the Vatican-accredited diplomats, 87-year-old Pope Francis called for a global ban on surrogacy to prohibit the practice universally. He described surrogacy as a deplorable act, adding that a child is a gift and never the basis of a commercial contract, and that it represents a grave violation of the dignity of the woman and the child involved. Now to Switzerland, where former Gambian interior minister Usman Sonko went on trial for crimes against humanity on Monday. Sonko faces charges including murder, multiple rapes and torture committed between 2000 to 2016. Swiss campaign group Trial International filed a complaint against him after collecting evidence along with other NGOs, with the case going ahead under the principle of universal jurisdiction for grave crimes. Nine Gambian plaintiffs will travel to Swiss court to testify. 54-year-old Sonko fled to Switzerland in 2016 after Gambian dictator Yahya Jame lost power. According to the Human Rights Watch, Jame was responsible for widespread abuses, including forced disappearances and extrajudicial killings. Regarded as one of the world's football greats, Franz Beckenbauer died on Sunday at the age of 78. Nicknamed Der Kaiser, Beckenbauer captained the German national team to a World Cup victory in 1974 and returned as manager in 1990 to win the tournament again. The former defender spent the majority of his club career at German giants Bayern Munich in the 60s and 70s before stints at New York Cosmos and Hamburger SV. Widespread tributes paid to Birkenbauer included German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who said he was not only one of Germany's greatest footballers, but also created excitement for German football for generations. Good morning. The cold snap has eased, but much of Korea is bracing for a blizzard today. Right now, wet clouds are dropping wintry precipitation to northern central areas, and snow will expand to central parts of the country this morning before spreading nationwide by the afternoon. Mountainous regions in Gangwon-do province could see more than 20 centimeters of snowfall. The rest of central areas in Gyeongsangbuk-do province could receive more than 10 centimeters of massive snowfall through tomorrow, with a preliminary snow advisory issued in many of central parts of the country today. Instead of snow, there could be rain with 5 to 40 millimeters of showers in the forecast. The winter storm could dump snow in the capital area in Gangwon-do all day today, while the south will see heavy snow from this afternoon into tomorrow at dawn. Then highs in most parts will be slightly higher this afternoon. So it's going to be a hectic evening commute. Drive and walk carefully out on the roads today. Temperatures, meanwhile, will stay warmer than norms for the next five days. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions.
We thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. We'll be back tomorrow for Wednesday's edition at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time.